Dr. Tara is a pediatric occupational therapist and a pediatric feeding therapist with more than 14 years of experience. She is an alumni of Manipal University. She helps children with feeding difficulties, delayed milestones, and writing problems, autism, ADHD, and other learning difficulties. She is also a certified phonics educator. And you can follow her on Instagram. Her Instagram page has tips and tricks on child development, workshops for parents on milestones and writing and phonics. And her page is dot underscore trails dot with dot Tara. That's right, Tara? Yeah, 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 right. So before I begin, I would just like to ask you one thing. So who is an occupational therapist? Could you please yes. tell us a little about it? So uh, many people... Uh ask me this question because it's upcoming field and we have only heard about physiotherapy and speech therapy, right? So uh, basically occupational therapy helps people to develop skills for everyday tasks uh, to live independently. So in occupational therapy, you have different specialization. Uh, you have uh, neurology, you have ortho, you have uh, psychiatry, you have pediatrics. So my specialization is uh, pediatrics where I help kids with, uh, you know, autism, ADHD, Down syndrome, developmental delays and all these things. So basically, uh, when it comes to kids, uh, their daily uh, tasks like beat play, be it their uh, schooling, how it affects the school or uh, their day-to-day, -day, you know, tasks like uh, dressing, brushing, eating, feeding. So we support all these things so that they can lead, a, you know, independent life as much as possible. That's very interesting because these are things which, uh, you know, are really, really, as a mother, I understand that you need help and everybody may not be very well equipped to handle them. And yes. once you are a young mother, you may need advice on all these things. So it's really, really mm -hmm. a very interesting field. So, so good. Okay. So today we would be talking about uh, a few issues with you and I will be beginning with, uh, you know, picky eating issues for young children. Mm -hmm. This is has always been in a problem area for, for most parents that children yes. don't eat. And if they eat, they don't eat as much as they should be eating or they're very picky and very fussy and very choosy. So the first question, you know, which I'm going to ask you is, what are the most common reasons for children becoming picky eaters? Yes. So uh, basically when we um, assess for feeding difficulties, we start from the beginning, like from birth, what happened? Because there are many, many reasons why a child can be a picky eater. So if, you know, you, you had a premature baby uh, and the child was uh, fed through a GI tube or force fed through a bottle or the pala day to, you know, uh, feed milk, it starts from there. So uh, studies also say that most premature kids are at the risk of uh, being uh, picky eaters or fuzzy eaters, problem feeders and all that. that. And many other reasons like uh, uh, frequent, you know, upper respiratory tract infections, swollen adenoids, dental problems, traumatic eating incidences where the child has had a bad experience of choking. And then some medical conditions like um, low iron, allergies, constipation, severe uh, reflux. Kids who have severe reflux are high, uh, you know, at high risk of uh, being picky eaters. Uh, and then some underlying issues like oral motor problems where the child has uh, restricted oral movements or sensory issues like kids with autism or uh, ADHD might be hypersensitive, hyposensitive to textures or smell. So kids having sensory issues, genetics. So studies, uh, you know, say that parents who don't have good relationship with food they can, you know, pass some traits to their kids also. And this I have seen in my consultations as well, right? 90% of the time when they say, you know, their kids are picky eaters, I ask parents, you know, do you think has kids, any of you are picky eaters? And 90% of the time the answer is yes. And then uh, a child's relationship, you know, with the feeder, like if you have constantly being, you know, uh, forcing the child or distracting the child, of course, the child is not going to have trust during meal times with the feeder. So that can also lead to picky eating and trust with food. If a child is not being exposed to different textures, different varieties, and suddenly at you know one and a half, two years, you give them everything, all the vegetables, fruits, they might not be open to try it. And then we label them as you know picky eater. 
So yeah, these are some reasons uh, why a child can be a picky eater. There are quite a few, and especially I'm so amazed that you know parents. Like and mm -hmm. it's really really true. Now that you are saying, if I also look back in the family, I can relate that you know sometimes the parents themselves are picky eaters. So children exactly. also. And uh, you'll be shocked to know, Nikita, that ninety percent of the time kids don't have any underlying issues. It is how is your approach? The family means structure is affecting their you know relationship with food. So ninety percent of the time it's that your approach. So now the next question is, how does picky eating affect a child's overall growth? Of course, I understand when you are not eating properly, it is definitely you're not getting as much nutrition. But then how serious is this? That if a child is eating a picky eater, how bad can it have an impact on a child's health? So, you know, these days uh, we see this uh, term picky eating being used for any child who does not, you know, have a good relationship with food casually right picky eating he's a picky eater she's a picky eater but not every child is a picky eater so when a child does not have a good relationship with food there are different kinds right so like i said 90 percent of the time kids don't have any underlying issues they're picky eaters but then there are some kids wherein you know it might not be just picky eating it's more than that we call them as problem feeders here the kids you know the variety of food they have is very very limited it's not more than say around 20 25 th items that they eat on a daily basis uh, and then we have something called as ARFID uh, that is avoidant restrictive food intake uh, disorder now this is very very rare but very very severe here kids might not take more than you know two to three food items on a daily basis that's all now these kids will be uh, you know, dependent on external source for nutrition, maybe a G-tube, maybe an NG-tube. And problem feeders and uh, kids with ARFID will have some, you know, uh, underlying issues and uh, nutritional deficiencies. It can be, you know, problem with their growth, severe nutritional deficiencies. Usually, picky eaters, they still have, you know, good amount of varieties that they eat. So, these kids might not have any underlying issues. And uh, it is the parents who are very, very anxious and, you know, it goes like a vicious cycle, uh, the force feeding, distraction feeding. When parents are stressed, obviously you're passing on your stress to your kids as well. That makes the mealtime even more worse. Very true, because I also agree with what you're saying. I also notice a lot of parents using some other terms with children, like he's very hyperactive. Now, uh -huh. hyperactivity is a very, very specific term in child psychology. Definitely, you can't use, definitely. It, you can't use it for every child who's a very active child. But mm -hmm. I see, so I understand what you are saying because it's true that picky eater word is used very, very, uh, very, very exactly. by everybody. But yes, stress, which is the other thing which now I'm coming to, stress at meal times. You know, mm -hmm. uh, how do we as parents, especially a lot of young parents who have had their first child, how do they ensure that they are able to feed the child properly mm -hmm. and without causing any stress, without causing any conflict? So what are some tips which, you know, mm -hmm. young mothers or young parents can follow at home to make mm -hmm. meal time really, you know, interesting and fun for the children? Exactly. So, uh, yes, I totally understand, especially first time parents, you know, they're very, very anxious. And uh, see, one thing to understand here is eating is a skill. Okay, so it is not that, you know, the minute you start solids, the child will start eating happily. No, right? So when a baby is born, we say the mother, no, that feed on demand. So when the baby demands, you feed, right? But when the same baby hits the six month mark, we forget the feed on demand concept, right? So feed also means, you know, breastfeeding, formula feeding and solids also. So here what happens is, our expectation of how much the child should be eating is very different from what actually the child's body needs. And that is what causes this panic. So trust your child. I would say trust the process. Trust your child. Um, usually, you know, uh, when we feel the child is not uh, eating enough, that is at seven, eight months, we start, you know, uh, distracting the child. The screens will come out. Force feeding uh, will happen. And this can, you know, actually ruin your uh, child's uh, relationship with food. So for new parents, what I would like to say is in the first year, uh, still, you know, if you're breastfeeding or if you're formula feeding, that is the main source of nutrition. 
anything that you add on is like a bonus, right? So first year, uh, rather than the quantity, you have to focus on the quality, okay? So basically, the first year is all about exploring the, you know, exposure to as many, uh, you know, flavors, as many, you know, textures, as many varieties that you can expose your child to in the first year, that remains as the baseline for your child's future relationship with food. So keep your expectation a little less. It is not much how much your, you know, their stomach and their bone is like the size of their fist. So how much food will, you know, just go. It is not much, right? A spoon or two spoon, two tablespoons, that's it. And we sit there with a bowl of rice or the puree and we feed the child till the child finishes that bowl. We, we don't let the child go, right? By forcing or distracting. So first year, focus on the uh, varieties and the textures. Uh, don't, you know, extend the stage of purees for a long time. I've seen parents uh, offering purees till one, one and a half years. If you do that, the minute, you know, you want to transition to coarse texture or lumpy purees, your child will find it really hard, right? So don't do that. By eight months, even if you are introducing purees, it's absolutely okay. Purees are also a texture. You can introduce purees. But by seven, eight months, you need to start making progression. And by one year, keep in mind that you need to make complete transition to family pot. You will not be cooking separately for your child after the first year. That's very interesting. A lot of interesting points you have made, which I've also made a note of. One is relationship with food, and that is mm -hmm. very important because I also feel a lot is happening, especially in the Indian context, screens come out with very exactly. young children, and then child doesn't even know what the child is eating. And uh, at mealtime, the TV being on in the home is a very, very common thing where what is going and inside the mouth. One common knows. thing, you know, parents tell me is that my child is never hungry. My child never asks for food. No hunger cues. The thing here is when the child is being, you know, uh, fed in front of the screen, the child does not know how much they're eating. Uh, they don't know the texture. They're not exploring with the food. So you're just stuffing the child. The child does not know when, you know, his hunger is gone or when he's hungry. There is no routine. They just look at the time and feed the child. They don't give a child chance to ask that, you know, I'm hungry. Many kids don't know the feeling of hunger. I say parents, you know, hunger is a beautiful feeling. You should let your child feel hungry. So hunger cues, that's the thing, you know, which many parents complain about. Another thing which I would like to ask is when should you seek professional help? Because if you are in, in the home scenario, there will always be grandmas or aunties mm -hmm. or people around who will always say, no, it doesn't matter, you know, let him be, let him eat. So exactly. how much should you wait and how, what is, what are some, you know, kind of pointers which you should be looking out for and then you should really, really seek professional help. Exactly. So uh, see, what I would say is even at six, seven months, if you are feeling stressed, you're not confident, you know, seek for professional help right then and there, right? But uh, like I said, eating is a complex uh, skill. So when you start at six, seven months, uh, your child might not, you know, um, just start eating well. For some kids, it will take time to learn the skill, to, you know, maneuver food in the mouth, to chew or whatever, swallow, all these things. Some kids take up till eight months to, you know, get the hang of it, of solids, right? Now, even at eight, nine months, if you feel that, you know, your child is not be uh, able to, you know, progress in terms of texture, there is constant gagging, constant vomiting for every meal, right? The child is just, you know, shutting the mouth closed. The child is just crying at the sight of food, right? If these are some, you know, signs that you're seeing, you can definitely reach out for help. For toddlers, say, after one year, uh, if you feel your child is, you know, completely rejecting uh, a group of food or uh, the amount of food that they eat, the varieties is very, very less, you know, about 8 to 10 on everyday basis. Uh, they're not, may, uh, you know, able to progress in terms of texture, only purees. When a small grain comes, they, you know, vomit or they gag, right? Uh, or if you feel the child is very, very stressed out during mealtimes, not only the child, even if the parent is stressed out during mealtimes, you feel mealtimes are battle, you can definitely take uh, professional help, wherein uh, we will rule out any underlying issues. If the child has any oral restrictions, sensory issues, or it is the, you know, mealtime environment that is, you know, creating pressure for the child. 
so we assess the routine so everything is assessed and we set it for we help parents to you know set that up for the child yeah these and, are really good pointers for young parents yeah. because you know many a times you don't know what you are and you keep wondering should you know whether the child will grow up and will start eating but some things which you have mentioned i have also come across many a times parents uh, of young children who are only used to yeah. eating you know these semi solid kind of things and they are not exactly. really exposed to texture so then they don't want to eat and they don't want to they never graduate uh, you know from that uh, puree exactly. or uh, you know eating to the family pot that never happens because so that's really really very very crucial and uh, you know parents are uh, uh... first time parents they get scared when the child gags at 7 8 months uh, when the child gags and uh, they're scared you know that okay it's choking uh, so let me you know just continue uh, with pureed food uh, but you have to understand uh, there is something called has you know this phasic uh, bite reflex so between the age of 6 uh, to say 10 months every child has this phasic bite reflex where when you put anything in the mouth they'll reflexively start chewing all right now this is the window you have to introduce finger food textures and all that so many parents uh, you know do it after the first year uh, wherein after 10 months this phasic bite reflex is gone and kids have to learn it by themselves voluntarily because this reflex is gone and that's the time when they are more aware of their surroundings they know they can control things they can reject things they develop preferences so introducing textures after the first year becomes such task it's very very difficult acceptance is very difficult i think this has really helped us uh, also to understand i have also learned a lot about uh, meal times and you know feeding and children so definitely this has been helpful now i would also like to quickly touch upon one more area mm-hmm. where i feel that you know once the child grows up after mm-hmm. eating the next area which is a really really a problem area for young parents is when the child doesn't want to write mm-hmm. or writing mm-hmm. issue Mm-hmm. and since you are an expert on that as well so first i would like to ask what are some of the most common writing challenges which young children face so i would also say you know writing challenges what parents also face when it comes to their children right the most common question uh, trust me every other day it's on my dms you know my child uh, hates writing my child simply you know starts crying the minute i take paper pencil out uh, disinterested you know not interested to write and then i ask them you know okay you tell me how old is your child they tell me 3 they tell me 4 right most of the time the issue is kids are not ready children they are not yet ready now uh, if you notice right if you know uh, in india kids are formally introduced to paper pencil tasks much earlier than many other countries in many other countries so they are not formally introduced to writing at least till 5 6 years and here it starts trust me from nursery 2 and a half they are sitting with pencil standing line sleeping line everything right and by 3 they should be writing words pvc words right so um, most of the time kids start developing aversion to writing because their hands are not ready pencil control is very difficult it's very difficult it's not that simple and parents tell you know my child is not interested to learn how to write a b c d it's not that your child is interested to learn but your child is not able to control the pencil yet that's why the aversion so i tell parents you know learning doesn't have to happen with paper and pencil we can teach how to form letters with different play activities you know with the stick with your finger painting or uh, you know um, just writing on a, you know sand or salt or whatever so learning how to write can happen there also so pencil control comes a little later you know by by 4 or 5 proper pencil control so see if your child is ready first and uh, with the older kids say 6 7 and above common thing that i uh, usually see is a poor grip right holding the pencil with the wrong grip uh, inadequate pressure when they are writing either too much pressure or very little pressure or uh, difficulty you know uh, copying from the board or difficulty to uh, you know uh, align or the space or the size of the letters legibility basically identifying of the letters spelling mistakes all these things are the issues that i generally see with older kids very very true because it's really true that children are not ready most of the time mm-hmm. so that's the reason exactly. why <clears throat> why they are not really interested so having said that what are some of the writing milestones which are there which you know parents should watch out for that my child is from this to this like many people are aware of say you know when the child starts walking crawling walking so they exactly. understand but for writing most people don't know if there are any milestones yeah 
So, uh, see, uh, like you said, there are milestones for, you know, uh, motor milestones and speech uh, milestones, which everybody is aware of. Uh, but when it comes to writing, writing also has milestones. The way your child holds a pencil also has a milestone, right? So by, say, 10 months or so, your child might develop this uh, pincer grasp, right? And by 12 to 15 uh, months, your child will uh, develop something called has a palmar supinator grasp. Okay, so they'll be holding uh, the pencil like this. All right, and uh, they will have dig digital pronate grasp. So they will be, you know, using this grasp uh, to scribble or something, right? And then by three to four, they'll have quadruple grasp like this using all the fingers, right? And by the end of uh, fourth year, you will see slowly they'll start holding the pencil in tripod grasp. Again, when they're holding by four, you know, when they're holding the pencil with tripod grasp, movements will not happen with fingers. It will happen with the shoulders and elbows, so big letters. It's only by the time, you know, they're between five to six, your child will develop a dynamic tripod grasp or a matured tripod grasp, wherein movements will slowly start happening from the fingers. That is when your child will write small within the lines, you know, with adequate space. That is when it comes, five to six. And that is why, you know, in most countries, they're introduced with paper pencil by that age because that is when they're ready, right? So my four-year-old, you know, is holding pencil like this. My child is not able to hold with the tripod grass. He's fine. I mean, absolutely right for his age, right? So when parents tell me, you know, uh, that my three-year-old is not able to write, I ask them, you know, okay, uh, can I ask your six-month-old baby to walk? It's like that. You know, you're asking your six-month-old baby to walk when you're asking your three-year-old to write, right? And then, yeah, all these pre-writing uh, strokes, that also has a milestone. So your child will start with uh, vertical lines, horizontal lines, circles, and then, you know, this plus sign, then cross, and then last we go for slanting lines. Okay, that's around, you know, four and a half years. And what is the first letter we teach our kids to write? A, which has a slanting line, right? So I always tell parents, you don't have to follow A, B, C, D pattern. Start with letters that have straight lines and sleeping lines, then go for, you know, uh, slanting lines, then go for curves. It does not have to be in that sequence. Very, very true, because the alphabetical order is good for the dictionary. So let mm -hmm. it keep it. Which, <laughs> which we which we don't use anymore. I mean, I asked parents, when was the last time you used a dictionary? I mean, things have changed now, no? Mm -hmm. So you put it in the phone and it phone to is our generation. Now they go to Alexa. Alexa, what is the meaning of this? They don't even have to type. Alexa will tell the answer. So yeah, you don't need the dictionary anymore. True, very true. Very true. So now the one of the last things which I would like to ask is when should a parent seek help for writing issues? Now, we know there are writing issues, we know there are milestones, but mm -hmm. then when should you seek profession? So, uh, see, I would still not worry if a four-year-old or even a five-year-old is, you know, not able to, you know, write uh, with that speed or legibility or small letters. I would still give them um, time. But say you are seven, eight, six, seven, eight-year-old is still having an immature grasp. Okay, your child is still holding the pencil like this, which is supposed to happen by two years, right? Your child is still holding the pencil with the awkward grasp, right? So that is one thing I would uh, notice. If your child is having difficulties with identifying letters, even at six, seven years, if your child is having difficulty to, you know, copy from, you know, the board, if your child is having uh, issues with uh, holding the pencil with the right pressure, Okay, if your child is complaining of uh, fatigue, your child is constantly com complaining of backache, you know, uh, not able to sit properly. So basically, we evaluate everything, the posture, how the placement of the book is, what pressure the child is. Because when you write using too much pressure, your hands will get tired. That is fatigue, which will impact the legibility of writing as well later, right? So if all these things you feel by six, seven, eight years, you can get in touch with the occupational therapist who will assess the child for, you know, what is missing. So, Dr. Dara, are you also running any programs, uh, you know, for yes. young parents? So, if you could also just tell us briefly about... Uh, uh, so, what when it comes to uh, writing, I have two programs. Uh, the first one is called Writing Without Tears. Uh, because, you know, in the first uh, five, six years, a lot of tears are there when kids write, right? So, that is uh, basically focused on zero to six years. 
so parents of kids uh, 0 to 6 and then I have something called as writing write so this is for parents uh, who are having kids 6 and above so parents ask me you know 0 to 6 0 years old you know for the first year what can why why do we even need to teach writing to kids so writing without tears is not about writing at all all right so basically writing has a lot of foundational skills uh, you know, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, hand strength, eye-hand coordination, orthographic coding, uh, sensory processing, all these things, right? Sensory feedback, uh, you know, uh, many other skills, cognitive skills, uh, visual perception and all these things. So basically in writing without tears, I talk about all these foundational skills, which with which, you know, you can make your child ready for writing journey it's not about writing at all and trust me uh, parents have found it so beneficial so when they give this so basically teaching them writing through activities in simple terms if i have to tell so parents have who have attended this program i, I give them a booklet i mean it is like ready they just have to follow the booklet right uh, they tell me at four the kids are ready by four also because they've done their foundation is strong right and uh, writing right for six and above, this mainly focuses on legibility, how you can get them to write, you know, uh, legibly uh, or neatly. I would not say good or bad handwriting because nobody has a good or bad handwriting. It is just legible. You should be able to read it, right? So interesting uh, thing about this class is usually when you have to work on, you know, the writing legibility, what we generally do is copywriting right four line no i don't know how many pages we have written as kids cursive writing books come out exactly and, you know. right so this writing right is uh you know teaching them how to write neatly or legibly through games through activities through fun uh, you know uh, terminologies so kids are interested to learn how to write neatly so it's a very different program where kids will enjoy Lovely, lovely to hear about that. And we at Little Amigo Nest always, you know, uh, look for such, you know, kind of collaborations and such kind of, you know, programs where we can inform our, you know, all mm -hmm. the people who are following us so that they get to know. And today, I think it was a very, very useful session where we learned so much about not just occupational therapy, but about some issues for children. And I am sure many of our uh, people who are watching us, they may, they will not understand. They may have learned it today itself that, you know, for feeding issues or for writing issues, you need to visit an occupational therapist. Yes, I have a program for uh, feeding also. So parents who are uh, having uh, difficulties with feeding, I have uh, sessions for them also. I take uh, sessions for uh, milestones for new parents to understand about my milestones because they panic, right? Is my child okay? Is he growing well? Is the development okay? So that program I have, I have a phonics program as well for parents. So these are some workshops that I conduct every month. Sure. So I, I think they can connect with you on your Instagram page. If they follow, yes. then they will definitely get to know about what more yes, is they'll happening. They'll get the updates, yeah. Sure. And we will also post, uh, you know, this video on our YouTube channel. And also we'll, uh, you know, connect on Instagram. So we will connect with you again, Dr. Tara. It was a very informative sure. session. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure for me as a co-founder of Little Amigo Nest to, you know, talk to you. It was a very, very informative session. I really Thank look forward to having you over again and, you know, discussing more issues. Thank you so much for having me over. Thank you so much. Thank you.